Good morning. Welcome to the final day of Journalism and Media Week at Leeds Trinity University. My name is Ali Thornton. I am a lecturer in media production. I am here today with my guest and very good friend, Harris Ahmed. Hi, Harris. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, I just need to do some housekeeping at the start. We're streaming live on YouTube and Facebook today. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments section of Facebook um, or underneath the YouTube video. We'll get those pulled in and we'll try to answer um, all of your questions and comments, if not during, at least by the end of the session. Um, so Harris is a professional photographer, videographer, media content creator, and director of H Digital. He is a very multi-talented human. Um, so I know we've got a little show reel um, to give you a flavor of the kind of things and the kind of work that Harris does. So let's get that queued up for you now. And this is his work. That's beautiful. Harris, your work is so glossy and so lovely. You've always loved cameras, haven't you? And, and making beautiful content. Yeah, no, um, it's definitely become a passion of mine over the last few years. Um, first of all, apologies if I'm like looking down when I'm speaking because the camera seems to be like above from the laptop. So hey, I'm that's all right. Pointing, we, we can see so, you yeah. look awesome. Cool. So um, <laughs> yeah, cameras, 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 cameras. Um, I never actually liked cameras back in sixth form, which was a funny thing. And when I did my, so I did a degree in digital media at London Metropolitan and they tried to teach us like film and TV for a course. Mm -hmm. And um, I, for me, cameras are like maths and I was like, it's not happening. Forget about it. I just want to do like graphic design and sketching and sure. that kind of stuff. So it's only after I left uni that I was like, oh yeah, cameras, you know, let me try that thing again that I tried at uni. And then my love for it came about. It really comes through in everything I've seen you make because obviously you have your professional client-based work, but then you mm. do this street photography too. That's so beautiful um, and really experimental. And you share that with people don't you through your youtube channel so you can see it, it's it's more than just your career it's like that's your whole lifestyle isn't it you you're the you're the camera man yeah yeah it's definitely become a lifestyle i mean um it's just uh i think if you want to be good at something you kind of have to practice it every single day like if you want to be mm -hmm. really really strong you can't just like wait till like the last week on holiday and then do 100 push-ups and think you're going to be you know fit and healthy it just, it just doesn't it just doesn't work that way it's, it's, it's about doing a little bit every single day so I think um I know I wanted to make a commitment and become good at photography and I was like I don't know how that's mm -hmm. going to happen but I know that if I use this camera every single day something will I'll get I'll eventually be good at something in terms of the camera and then um I think the only thing that was accessible for me at the time was just going for walks I love going for a walk so it just felt natural to keep a camera by my side and if I find anything that looks interesting a beautiful piece of light um yeah then photos would happen I suppose that will resonate with a lot of people at the moment because obviously we're restricted um in yeah. where we can go and what we can do um have you been doing a lot of street photography still throughout lockdown to to mm. sort of keep practicing and keep motivated or is, is that something that sort of COVID's put a put a stop to well it's quite interesting actually um when the first lockdown it was tough because i was living in the suburbs of london and um mm -hmm. there's not a lot going on <laughs> Just, <laughs> and you know personally ali too like you we <laughs> where i used to live is where we used to go for sixth form so it was not like 
just like houses and streets. So oh, sure. Like, it's, yeah, it, there's yeah. not a lot happening there. And then all. especially like the first lockdown, everyone was a bit like paranoid. We don't know how this is going to play out. We don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. You want to put gloves on? Like, should I Absolutely. bring my camera? Is it safe to bring my camera? Will I touch anything? It mm -hmm. might be a bit um, awkward. Now I've kind of moved a bit closer to central. Um, it's a lot more accessible for me. So mm -hmm. I am privileged in that respect where if I want to go for my hour long exercise, I can just, there will be activity, there will be something interesting to see. So it's yeah. a lot easier. But um, just to give some good advice, um, when I did live back in the suburbs, I was inspired by a guy called Jonas Rask. So right. if anyone's watching and they're looking for a good piece of inspiration on how to do photography at home, this mm. guy Jonas Rask, um, he's an ambassador for Fujifilm. Wow. One of the camera brands, and um, he did this thing called the 50 50 challenge. So you'd get a 50 mil, and you'd take in a month, you'd have to take 50 photos of that 50 mil. So it'd be one photo a day. Yeah, I think 50 50 challenge. So 50 photos could be 30, I can't remember. But the whole point was you have to get creative, you have to find a way to take an interesting photo every single day with that mm -hmm. one lens. So there's a bit of restriction, which with, with, with restriction comes some creativity because you have to do mm -hmm. some of it some thinking, which is quite interesting. And then, um, yeah, like, I think for me personally, that was not easy to go out every single day and try and get 50 shots in 50 days. So what mm -hmm. I did was I started doing shots at home, started taking maybe some lifestyle shots. Maybe my girlfriend, Chloe, was cooking. Maybe she was doing some mundane activities and trying to make that look really interesting and see what I could get. So I think, um, during lockdown that could be a really good activity to do that sounds like excellent advice and i'm sure i know there's lots of our students listening so um or watching so i'm sure they will be taking that great advice can you tell me what your favorite gig i you know or job or or mm. piece of work you've done is do you have a favorite is it possible to choose one it's going to be difficult because I don't like to do the same thing every single time. So one thing that I keep saying, and it's kind of become a little bit of a motto now, is um, today we're going to do something a little bit different. And mm -hmm. for me, that keeps life and the job interesting. And I think that's why I got into photography. It's not like an office job where nine to five, you come in, you know you're going to do the same mundane routine, mm -hmm. and you just feel like a robot. But with photography, because the clientele will keep changing, the activity will keep changing. One day you're going to be with a chef and then you're going to start learning all about culinary skills because you have to take <laughs> photos of this culinary skills. And then tomorrow you're going to be at the gym with a guy trying to do like pull-ups and then you're going to have to like yeah. learn about why you need to do pull-ups a certain way and why you have to angle it a certain way. So trying to take photos of different things every single time is why mm. I stuck with photography and I feel like it's really helped make my life interesting. Mm. So how do you find clients then if you're looking for work to do? Is it usually something that you're hoping to do or um, how do you, what's that process? How do you find those jobs? Hmm. How do I find jobs? <laughs> um, do you want to know how I found jobs or do you want to know how I find yeah. jobs now? Like which one would you like to know? Because they're two different processes. Well, is, is there anything you're working on at the moment? How did you get into into making that okay at the moment well um it's kind of tricky because with lockdown and everything you don't have a lot of um choice to go out there and film elaborate stuff so i get you i think a cool example would be lensbro hotel that was such a hard pitch mm -hmm. but i had to pitch to do it for free because I know okay. that if I wanted to do other hotels in the future, they would need to see another hotel being done. So that's something I'm currently working on and it's on the back burner now because hotels are closed. Um, sure. The economy is gonna be quite tight. They wouldn't wanna be spending much money right now, but I managed to squeeze that in just before lockdown. And the way I managed to pitch to them was like, it's all the lifestyle work that I've done. I tried to put together work that showcases something that emulates a hotel. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, it was for free kind of um, was a huge selling point. But at the same time, you know, hotels, they have a big image and the marketing is very, very strict. So you, you need to kind of 
have the right connections, I suppose. So whilst mm -hmm. being in the industry for, for so for so many years, you eventually start to know the right people and, and you can start to ask the right questions. So that was one which, you know, I tried to like pitch to hotels after uni and mm -hmm. I got shut down like anything. It just never really happened. <laughs> but I was like, you know what, I'll come back to this one day in the future. And behold, yeah. five, five years later, Finally, I knew some people, you know, I've done my homework. I've started to run around and meet the right people. Mm -hmm. And I finally got to do a hotel shoot, which was something that, you know, it, it feels nice because you you put that, you project it out there that it's going to happen someday. And then you finally get to do it. So it's like it came full circle. So that was, a, that was an interesting one. And now that I have that, hopefully maybe once the economy gets better, I can go and finally do some cool hotel work because... I came from a hospitality background in marketing, so it, it felt natural to like, rather than just sitting there putting the, fo fo the vi photos and videos on Facebook and TripAdvisor, why don't I actually make the videos? Mm -hmm. So when you're working with a client, can you talk us through what your process is? How does that work for you and for them? Mm, how does it work for the client? Ooh, that's a... Well, I think number one is you want to provide value and you want to be a solution to their problem. So mm -hmm. uh, a good example would be I'm working with a coffee shop right now. They're called um, Colombian, the Colombian Coffee Company. They're based in Borough Market, mm -hmm. Southwark, London. Um, if you're looking to get some, get some great beans, I highly recommend them. <laughs> it's a bit far away from us at the minute. I'm you can order the beans online, you see. That's the, that's the cool thing. You can post me some. Exactly, I will. Don't worry, I will. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that they had a, a problem where um, I went there and I wanted to learn how to make espresso, do it the cool traditional way where you weigh the beans, you weigh the shot. And I asked mm -hmm. the guy, I was like, look, man, um, I bought your beans, but I'm just not getting the same results when I grind it and put the settings on. Like, can you tell me what your recipe is? He was like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I'll tell you what the recipe is, blah, blah, blah. By the way, you know, we, we do barista classes. You should come. This is what we teach. This is what we do. You know, you'll learn so much. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm down. So I went online, went on the website, and I was like, cool, there's only like two sentences about it. And it's 100 quid. Mm. And I was a bit like, hmm. You know, if they would have had a video, maybe more people would book. It would be a bit more of a easier to pitch to the general mm -hmm. public. So I went back. When I went to buy another batch of beans, I was like, hey, you know, the shot came out a lot better now. But I remember you said you can buy the beans on, you know, sorry, you could buy the, you can book a class online. And But, you know, it, there's not much on there to kind of convince me. There wasn't, you know, much to attract me to it. Mm -hmm. You know, what, um, have you ever considered maybe putting some more information, perhaps having a video, maybe some right. examples, maybe a few photos of you giving like demonstrations of, what it looks like to be in a class with you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you're absolutely right. You know, everyone's been telling me I need to really like help emulate what it would be like to be in a class with me. Mm -hmm. If only I had someone and I was like, yeah, you know, I make videos. And he's like, oh, do you? And then I was like, got my phone out. I was like, look, this is what I did for an Italian restaurant. This is what I did for this. And then the conversation just went into fireworks. And the, and before you know it, I was out the door and he was like, we've, we've exchanged phone numbers and mm -hmm. we started the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that we didn't talk about money straight away because I think um, it depends which, with which client you're with. Someone mm -hmm. who's a small business owner, who's a decision maker, who's on the shop floor, they're mm -hmm. there because even one, the business is still growing. And number two, they're very, very passionate about what they do and it's very sacred to them and they don't want to just give it to anyone. So you can't just be like, I'm worth two thousand pounds a day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't want to work with you. So mm -hmm. it takes a while to like develop trust and show that you care about helping this person succeed. And sure. I think that's your job as a photographer, a videographer, a graphic designer, perhaps. Like you have to care about the process and wanting them to succeed. So mm -hmm. um, we had a few meetings. Um, I came up with a few ideas. He liked them. We tried them out. It was executed. Eventually, the money talk came about, um, and we came up with a cool retainer plan. Mm -hmm. So I'd, you know, X amount of money per month, and I would do like maybe some short videos, and it would be on a monthly basis because we can see that the competition. And I gave examples of the competition mm -hmm. and what they're doing, and it's 
It's about consistency rather than having that one epic golden egg cup, that one strong video that's going to like do it all. It doesn't work that way. So mm -hmm. it's about showing a plan. It's about showing what the future looks like and return on investment. And I think once you think that way, um, clients can kind of be on your side a bit more. Mm -hmm. So you're really using your knowledge of the industry and of business and marketing and all the things you already know about that. And you're sort of bringing them into that, aren't you? You know, rather than just I'm providing you a video um, or I'm providing you some photography, it's you're bringing them into the process and they're bringing you into their world as well. So you, it's more of a conversation, isn't it? Rather than just a, you know, point of service thing. Yeah, definitely. I think... Um... Like any kind of um, business, there's some kind of relationship and you need to kind of develop that relationship. Otherwise, it, you know, for some people it's it's very off-putting. and But for some people it is just very transactional. It's like, hey, I need you to shoot my daughter's um, christening or whatever it might be. Sure. Here you go. I want it done for £250. Get it mm -hmm. done. Here's the photos. Bye. Never speak to them ever again. <laughs> You know, I, I was there for your special moment. I hope it would have been nice to, like, say, I hope you're doing well. You know, take care of yourself. I will catch up in the future someday. You know, like, something like that. Mm. So some clients can be like that. It's a bit, bit odd. <laughs> I suppose everybody's got their own needs. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, so what advice would you give to a student or, or just somebody who wants to start out in this line of work? Um, uh, yeah. Just if they're like they're just getting going and they're thinking, damn, where where do I begin? Right. All right. So I face this question a lot, and I've always got like my answer is pretty strong about this. Um, don't be afraid to do free work. I know that people keep saying, don't do free work, don't do free work. But if you haven't got an example of what the client needs, they ain't gonna hire you. Simple as it's not a good business move. If I'm trying to hire like my first graphic designer, I want to see a great example of something that will help me. And if they don't have it, it's really hard to trust them because it's a it's a huge investment for a small business. So, how do you get that work to pitch to the client? It's a conundrum, right? Chicken and egg situation. Yeah. So um, the way I, the best way I found it is find people that do what you're looking for and that need help. So let's use the example of the coffee guy. He runs a small coffee shop. He needs videos. He knows he needs videos of coffee, but he doesn't have a lot of money to give right away. I, I need to do work for the coffee shop, so I'm willing to lower my price or do it for free because I really want a strong portfolio of coffee videos, coffee photos, so I can do more coffee work in the future because I'm a coffee enthusiast. So the way to match the two and get some some work out of it for free but not being screwed over because that's the thing that happens to a lot of young people getting in the industry mm -hmm. they get screwed <laughs> over uh, yeah. they'll do like 10 hundred revisions and then they get they feel like they're getting screwed you know they're getting um what's the word i'm looking for um they're being taken advantage yes, of yes being taken advantage of um my suggestion would be find someone that's willing to allow you to have your own creative input and style. So you would be like, look, I'm going to do this for free on the condition that you let me do it the way I want to do it because I don't have, I'm doing this for my portfolio. If you ask me for 10 hundred revisions after, I mean, don't say it like that because that sounds a bit rude. But <laughs> you're trying to avoid having to do 10 hundred revisions after because if you start doing revisions on a project, it becomes a job. Mm -hmm. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to hate it. You never want to do it again. And then you're going to think that all clients are crappy people and people don't know what they want. And it, it, it go, you go into like a sad place after. And then it, for mm -hmm. some people, they never go back into it. And it's like, you know, this is a headache. How am I ever going to make money out of this? It's not fair. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very strong and you need to know what you want out of it and be very clear with them. Say, look, you're going to get a free piece of video or a free piece of work that's going to showcase your beans and where they come from and how they're grinded or whatever it is, find the topic and we're going to nail that topic. I'm going to do it my way, how I like to do it, and that's how I, I want to do it. I'll be okay with this transaction. I'm going to get something out of it, which is I get to do it in my style and the way I want to do it, 
you're only allowed to maybe one or two revisions. Maybe the title card was wrong. Maybe you got the name wrong, whatever. Or maybe you forgot to get the shot of something really important. That's okay. You can live with that. But mm -hmm. they have to live with the fact that they're not going to get, you know, if, if they start asking for too much after I try to squeeze a lot out of you, it's not going to happen. They know that from the beginning. So there's a very clear, you know, transaction. And then you get what you want. They get what they want. If it works really well for them, they will see the value. They will hire mm -hmm. you again. You're going to have something amazing to showcase. You're going to go out there in the world and have that. And you can say, look, I've done this. I can do that for you. I could make it better. Mm -hmm. and I, th I think that's the thing. So overall, whenever you try to get that free work, make sure that you position straight away that I get to do it my way and you're getting it for free. And this is the deal. Awesome. You give lovely advice, Harris. That's, that's really good. I really hope cool. it's helpful, but that's what it I found. Is. You, you're so like you're obviously so passionate about what you do, and you're so into it that it's it makes me want to <laughs> get started. And you want to go and film some coffee then? <laughs> hey, maybe I don't know. I've done my share of filming coffee at, yeah, for this year, but maybe next year. <laughs> um, so, on that note, on the note of sort of like clients and client brief and working together, um, something that we do with our students a lot because we're really focused on employability and sort of those real world working skills that you're going to need when you get once you graduate um how do you handle a brief that's sort of feels like it's drastically changed maybe halfway through or what do you do if you feel like you've delivered something and then maybe the client feels like it's not what they expected or they changed their mind um have you got any advice for how you would handle something like that i'm actually going for that right now <laughs> oh no so, yeah, how are you good. handling it <laughs> um i'm biting my tongue a lot because it's a family friend so <laughs> oh okay that's not yeah that's so not... i'm biting my tongue a little bit right now but um overall um it is a common theme it happens so number rule number one is whatever you do get it in writing if it's a phone call, you're going to be like, I'm going to write down on this conversation and I'm going to email it to you. And this mm -hmm. is the plan. And we, we have to stick to it because you're only allowed two revisions. That's it. Ah. If, that would be my number one. That usually gets them in the ballpark of like, oh, this is my limits. These, I know where the boundaries are right now already, so I can't push it. Things do happen, unfortunately. Like... Um, I've worked on, the, on their side as well, so I know that from the business side of things, like plans change. Director has a different goal, or maybe they're trying to, the clients, they're, they're, maybe it's a B2B client, and their client that you, they're trying to pitch to with your work has changed their brief as well. And like, what can you do about it? You know, it's not, your, it's not their fault and it's not your fault, but we need to figure it out. So maybe have a rate where, like, if things deviate or change, this is the fee. So everyone knows from the beginning, like, this is how it's going to be and if we're all comfortable with it. The worst thing is um, don't ever assume that there's an understanding without having it in writing. Um, and I think, you know, people who are watching this and are at uni definitely don't take your education for granted. This is where your degree, like, comes into full force because I could learn, I learned photography after my degree, but I think what helped me to, like, stay on track and really push for it was like knowing how to write the emails knowing how to plan mm -hmm. the the brief for the client mm -hmm. and have that in structure because that takes away a lot of the pain points later there's still going to be pain points but you want to mitigate them much as you can and just so you know there is no guarantee like i've worked on the micro business levels to like the top like corporations in the world where you know they'll have a change of heart later or maybe they want to add something else and you're like want to scream into a pillow and you're like i can't believe that <laughs> this is happening with like one of the world's like top four companies like what's going on like how dare they but it happens cool that's it's, you've got a very level-headed approach about it and i think that's important isn't it because it's it's a creative medium and everybody's going to have their sort of vision of it aren't they but mm. as long as you can work together to find get like you know a really That's nice product working together you want to you want to presume that you are with um you're on their side mm. and you're like you're you're willing to work it out with them so if they turn around and say oh i don't like you know no, i don't like it um sorry things have changed mm -hmm. you're like 
I'm sorry to hear that. I hope we can work. Dif I want to help you fix and work around this. Sure. But however, you know, like um, this is going to cost me two extra days of work. So you're on the understanding that it will cost you X amount extra. You know, there's mm -hmm. a way of like having that customer service skill where you can have a bit of sympathy and then kind of try to say this is the resolution. This is how much it's going to cost. Nice. So um, I want to ask you about YouTube. Sure. Um, because you have this great YouTube channel. You put out um, tutorials for various pieces of camera equipment. Um, you show your sort of, you know, when you do like a 50-50 challenge or another type of challenge on there, it always goes up. I am always watching your videos because <laughs> they're so good. Um, how does that feed into your maybe paid work or client-based work and and how does that fit into your life what what's great about having the youtube channel all right so it goes back to essentially when i was trying to get myself established and have some kind of portfolio to work with and show people mm -hmm. like um i didn't even know what i wanted to do i just know i wanted to work in this field um, I got inspired by a guy called Peter McKinnon. So anyone who's into photography probably has heard of him or is a big fan of him, actually, because he's really showcased like you can do it. And um, it really inspired me to if you get the work that I wanted to get, because if you wanted to work with a pizza company, you're just going to have to get shots of pizza. But if you, how do you do that? So I think it's a twofold thing. So number one, it was a great way to experiment and shoot things in my own style in the way that suited me on my terms. I didn't have to answer to anyone. I didn't have to meet any deadlines. It's all on me, my own personal expression, experimentation. That's, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is also, you know, it's, it's a great way to learn your camera. It's a great way to just keep practicing. And it's also understanding that, I mean, I found this out afterwards, uh, I did it, but being in front of the camera takes a lot of skill. There's a lot of stuttering, there's a lot of, um, it's a very painful process. And when you finally film a client who's never been in front of the camera before, you'll understand what they're going through and you can coach mm -hmm. them. And I found that's been a great um, thing that's come out of it, to know like, if I'm, doing an interview with uh, someone who's the head of a corporation and I've never been on camera before, mm -hmm. you can kind of ease them into talking in front of the camera, um, yeah. how to, to do it, make sure that like they pause so you can make sure you can edit that cut into the transition. <laughs> like, otherwise, you know, they'll just ramble and be like, blah, 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 and it's just like, no, you can't edit that bit out. And then they're going to come to you and be like, can you edit that bit out for me? And you just, so I'm going to do a tangent now about client work again, but. <laughs> That's essentially the 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 thing about YouTube that I really like. Number one, it was um, it was just passionate, a great way to do things on my own term, try things out, be part of a wider community. I didn't know any photographers around me. Mm -hmm. um, no one really cared about photography. Um, I was getting screwed over by a lot of clients doing cool work, but I had to do it on their terms and their style. Mm -hmm. I, like, I want to find out my own voice. I want to find out my own style. So. Doing YouTube allowed me to do it my own way. And then um, you get feedback online. It's quite brutal. But you learn to find yourself. And then also it helps you with client work. You know that if you're going to do talking head videos, you need a light, you need a camera. You're going to need the light lens to do it. You're so, mm -hmm. it becomes second like nature. It's like when you, first time you opened your iPhone, you're probably like, where the hell is everything? But now mm -hmm. that you use it every single day, you know exactly where to find it, which menu to go to, and boom, 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 done. So it's the same same thing for me. I know my camera inside out now, and I can film anything. Hmm. I think we've got some questions that have come in. Should we have sure a thing. look? Yeah, yeah, let me know which one you want to go for. So we've got Martha Sanders says, what camera equipment would you recommend for someone starting out? And what are your favorite cameras and editing software to use? Oh boy, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, my question, my answer to that has always been choose a camera that you enjoy using. So whether that's um, I think the the big four right now are like Canon, Sony, Nikon. Maybe I think Fujifilm is definitely in the question right now. I like to use Fujifilm because I love the aesthetic. I love the way it works. I just you know if I want to pick something up and use it, I'm more likely to do work with it. 
Mm -hmm. um, if something is like complicated and I don't like it, for example, I love Canon, but then the work I was going into didn't fit the need for, Canon wasn't helping me anymore. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to use it anymore. I was picking up the Fuji more. So I was like just a natural, like the right tool for the right job. So whatever you're doing, um, keep, pick up the camera that you like. Um, because all cameras are good now, right now. All cameras are amazing. They all do everything that you want. They have all of them have the same frame rates, good quality video, um, really high megapixels. So they're all really, really good. Pick the one that you love. In terms of editing software, um, you have a lot more choice than you did before. You have DaVinci Resolve, which is free, absolutely free to use. Um, the only thing on the paid version that you get extra is like two things that. It's not going to like cripple your video if you don't have them. It's going to be like noise reduction and stuff, which is like super advanced anyway. Mm. Um, Premiere Pro, which I'm sure university uses, right? Yep, yep. The, Among the whole Adobe other suite, right? pieces of software are available. <laughs> yeah, so Adobe's great, but um, I, have a, I have a funny relationship with Adobe. Their stability is not the greatest, but I can live with it because I'm just. I'm in the ecosystem. I do a lot of like graphic design and mm -hmm. Photoshop, so I need to kind of have that ecosystem. Otherwise, if I go into different programs, it just throws me off. Uh, Final Cut is amazing, really easy to use. If you're a Mac user, just just go with Final Cut. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so we've got, I think, the two-part question now from Abby Middleton. If a student wanted to get out there and experiment with their camera, so photographs taken on a construction site, that's really specific. <laughs> How would you approach that in these difficult times? Oh, and boy. then just to add Abby's second part is also how do you go about promoting the work? How, so how could Abby go about promoting the work they produce? Um, is an Instagram account enough? Hmm. So if you wanted to go out there and experiment with a camera, experiment, um, photographs, I mean, do you have access to construction? construction side, do you know someone that will allow you to go there and they'll give you a top hat and I would and hope with hat. permission, signed permission and a valid risk assessment, um, Abby. <laughs> yeah, I think that is um number one, make sure you get permission. If you know someone, maybe ask. Uh, I got a feeling that if you go to a construction site, no one's gonna know anything about like letting you come in. You'd have to know like the corporate person to do that. Otherwise, treat it as a piece of street photography. So you're not going to get anyone's face in it, but you're going to get like the silhouettes of like guys working, maybe get a wider angle. So you're not really like taking anyone's identity. Mm -hmm. But if you're from afar, you can try and showcase the aesthetic or the scenery of wherever you live right now. I think that's a good thing to play with. I remember once in Covent Garden, there was a guy like, on one of those machines that takes you right to the top and um, where you can fix the, light, the lights. Oh, a cherry picker. Is that what that's yeah, called? Yeah, yeah, Where it like goes, uh, yeah. And it was fixing the lights and, you know, the light was like illuminating and causing, causing this cool silhouette and I took a photo of it. I haven't edited it yet, but I feel like that's going to be a cool photo and it's quite different because it's not every day that you get to see that. So I had my camera on me at the right time and he was like really going for it and the light was beaming in his face. We don't know what it looks like. so. In my eyes, it's okay to kind of take that photo. It's part of the wider context of like a nice London shot. So mm -hmm. that's one. What's the second question she has? So is an Instagram account enough to promote the work that people are producing? Uh, it's a great portfolio to have because what I found is if you're going to meet people and then the conversations switches to you do photos, boom, here's my Instagram. Job is done. But don't think the Instagram account is where people will find you. It's just a great accessible place where your work is visually seen straight away and the right when the right person comes along. Um, there's less questions involved. You don't have to like prove yourself as hard. Mm -hmm. So if you are gonna make that Instagram account, make it really purposeful to, I'm gonna put my work here and this is where people need to go to find it. Mm -hmm. um, having a website definitely helps. Um, not so much for the photos. I think that if the Instagram account has showcased the great photos, just present them better on the website, but make sure you have the contact details. Um, maybe talk about the clients that you have. This is a great place to talk about who you worked with, which projects you've done. Mm -hmm. You were the solution to the problem. You know, they, need, they needed photos because, and you did it. 
and the result was it worked mm -hmm. out great. They got more clients. I think if you're going to have a website, that's what it's going to be for. So I'm just going to take some water. Sorry. And um, a lot of people use websites for testimonials and things, don't they? So if you can get some really great feedback, maybe off a client, is that yeah. useful? Definitely. Um, testimonials are really, really strong. It showcases your um, your experience. And I think with photography, people care about experience a lot. They just want to, because for example, with events, um, you ain't going to be able to shoot that event again. You're not going to be able to shoot that wedding again. So they want to see reliability. Lovely. So next we have Elijah Price. What's the best way to improve at street photography and getting to know your camera? Hmm. I think um, just going out there and keep shooting. There's no right or wrong answer. And I think if I started to give you like my opinion on what street photography is, it wouldn't really become special because the lot of street photography that I do is now starting, I do it for myself and I find my own style, I find what I like and my aesthetic. And for me, that's my street photography. And some people don't like it. Some people say like, no, street photography needs to be done the way in like the 1950s, you need to get a 35 mil, you need to go up to someone's face, use a flash and really snap their face. And for me, that's not my style, that doesn't, go in line with my ethics. And I think that's quite invasive, and especially in, in a time like today where, you know, privacy and stuff is quite, you know, it's quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. So if I told you like what street photography should be like, um, it, might, it might not work for you, you know, like um, mm -hmm. go out, go on Instagram, go out there, see what street photography you really, really like, what you want to emulate and practice that. And eventually through practice and a repetition, you'll learn your camera. You know what settings to use for this type of scenery. If you see cars going by, you wanna get that blurry shot, but you still wanna get the, the background and focus. Mm -hmm. Play around and see. So next time you see those situations, that scenery, you know exactly which settings to go into and boom, 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 you can get the shot. Um, if you wanna take a portrait, you know that, you know, I, wanna, I really wanna go to F1.4 just to get that crispy, front face and then blurry background, or you know that this is a cool scenery, I should go down to F5.6 because, you know, I really want to get everything in focus. So yeah, keep trying repetition. Nice. Next one is from Jaisha Nelson. What What's the top tip or steps that we need to take that you'd recommend when trying to start a business? So any, like, any yeah. new starter top tips? Start in the business. Um, number one, find a solution to a client's problem. They don't have maybe a video for their online courses. They don't have a photo showcasing their value proposition. And then you will have examples of that. And then you can, it's all about data, right? So right now, the way business are being pictured is that you need to have data to showcase there's a true return on investment. Mm -hmm. Because that's what a business is and that's why a business transaction is for. If they mm -hmm. want to hire you, they want to make more money because you're going to be the, the bridge for that. Mm -hmm. your, your service is going to help them generate more revenue. So once you kind of like really get that into your head, um, you really start to think about how you can help that client and then you can start thinking of building a portfolio that showcases that process and mm -hmm. start writing about it. Um, the more you write about it, the more you take photos and examples of it, you have a good strong portfolio. You can then start hiring people and say, hey, I'm double booked today. Stephanie, can you handle this client tomorrow? And then next week we can all come back and try and put this all together and boom, you have an employee and then you can you know, uh, one advice would be register a company or be a sole trader, register that earlier on. Um, it's a lot, because that stuff gets complicated and I hate it, to be quite frank. <laughs> I hate paperwork, I hate taxes, but it's a necessary evil. So the quicker you learn that, because no one teaches you that, mm. um, find people you trust that are willing to help you with that. Because I know from my personal experience, it's not something that I enjoy. So the look, my dad gave me the best piece of advice, which was, um, to register a company and I had to deal with it. But if I would have done it like now, oh my God, I think I would have, um, it wouldn't be nice. It's stuff to think about maybe that people might not have ever had to deal with before or sort out before. So that's awesome advice. 
We have more. We have Kyle Lambert. Okay. You talked about how the first lockdown affected you and your photography. Do you think that will change through this lockdown? Do I think the first lockdown? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to change this time because um, I have a bit more confidence in my health and safety. I know my, I know the limits now. I know, um, you know, you can, you don't have to wear a mask when you when there's no one around you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's simple things like that. Um, I'm not really going to be going to crowded places. Uh, I know where the safe areas are. Um, yeah, I think it's a little. I think everyone has a bit more confidence and knowing what their limits are now. So I think taking the camera out with you is not going to be such a anxiety, you know, it's not going to be anxiety inducing or as it used to be. So if you do want to go for that hour walk of yours, like I think everyone has a common sense and they know their limits now. Before it was tricky because am I even allowed to take the camera out of the house? That was the number one question. You know, that was a great barrier for people. But now we know that, okay, you know, we know what the, the the science is saying and whatnot, so we can have a bit more common sense and we can make it accessible again. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So next we have Jenny, Jenny Keane. With smartphones, um, everyone thinks they're a photographer. <laughs> How does this impact on you as a professional? Uh, it actually helps me. It helps me sell my my case because if everyone has a smartphone and everyone's taking crap photos, we gotta be we gotta be blunt, right? <laughs> Say like what you, you really think, Harris. Yeah, you need to be confident in your work. Um, that's why I always had the bit of arrogance just there, is because if you don't have confidence in your work, um, people will just try to take advantage of you. So uh, I had a client that wanted to like me to take a photo with the subject here and the logo and the background, and he was trying to do it on his phone, and he was like, oh, look, I've got it on my phone. And I was like, okay, let me try and get the nice lens, which would really help bring the background closer to the foreground and really make it look crisp and nice. So I used like an 85, took the shot, and I'd say, oh, is this what you were looking for, sir? And he looked at it and was like, yes, that's exactly the shot. Wow, it looks so much nicer. <laughs> and I think that's where your job comes in to help their vision, but take it to the next level. And this is where the return on investment comes in and you really want to showcase that your value for money because your life of it, your years of experience and the tools that you're using, you know, they ain't, they ain't for nothing. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I have to say. <clears throat> so Rachel Meacham would like to know, what's your favorite thing about your line of work? What's my favorite thing about my work? Mm. <clears throat> I 50-50, so I used to do a lot of fine arts and stuff and sketching, painting, and drawing, and I love the therapeuticness where you sit down at your desk and you turn on some music or listen to a podcast and you just sketch away. Mm -hmm. But the, I'll also, you know, you can't sit down forever and it gets, you know, annoying. You want to be moving, you want to be running around. So meeting people, going out, um, taking, going for the shoot for the shoots, that's like my physical side of it like you're running around and then I still get to have my therapeutic side where I can sit down edit um, have my creative time my alone time and it's that nice balance of 50 50 that I found photography gave me as opposed to maybe like sketching or fine art where I was just glued to a desk and eight hours would pass by and you'd be like I'm only halfway through awesome so unfortunately that's all the questions we have time for um, Chris, I wonder if you could, before you go, just give us your quick top tips for finding clients um, that will help our students or anybody else who's looking for a client um, before we sure. go. Okay, cool. So uh, my mum has always like been my greatest hero in the respect that when she used to help me write my essays, she'd always be like, imagine the person you're writing the essay for has no clue what the hell you're talking about. So you're going to have to simplify everything. And I think if you're a Unity University student right now, rather than thinking that photography um, is a useless degree, it's not because what you have to do a lot of writing. And I think that train, that thinking of how to explain something to someone that doesn't know anything is what you're really the real value and what you're really going to be taking into the real world. Is a lot of the clients out there don't know how this is going to help them, mm -hmm. and it's your job to show them. And there's quite a there's quite a lot of competition out there. It's very saturated, so you will have to do that. 
that sacrifice of going out there, getting the free work. But if you use a method of not um, being taken advantage of, like showing your boundaries and saying, you're going to get a free video, you're going to get a free photo shoot on the condition that I get to do it my way, my creative style, and find people that you trust. You'll build a great portfolio. You'll build great connections. And eventually, people will start hitting you up for that specific product. So always think about your photography as a product. And that product is going to be useful to showcase or sell a specific um, service. And then that way, you can start thinking about how did this turn into a business? I think a lot of people get stuck because they're like, well, I don't get to do, I don't get to have creativity. The client is really annoying. Um, we can go on and on about all the problems. Everyone knows the problems. But the solution, I think, is that your work is a product, and you're using this product to help generate revenue by showcasing the client service. Once you kind of follow that pattern, and then use your university skills of taking the client on the journey and saying, this is how it's going to help you. This is why photography is so great. I think you're onto a winner. Amazing. On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up for today. Thank you so much, Harris. Your advice oh, no has worries. been invaluable. I know everybody watching will have got a lot out of this talk today. And I've had a lovely time too and got lots out of it too. So thank you. It's lovely to speak to you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, enjoy the rest of your last day of journal journalism and media week. Um, we'll, If you look on the Twitter for journalism and media week, um, you'll be able to get in touch with Harris and any of our other speakers. Um, but it's goodbye from us for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.